Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute. Just letting everybody uh, sign on. I can see the participants are, are joining quickly here. All right, so I think everybody who has tried to get on has been able to get on now. Um, thank you for joining us this morning for CAREX, the how, what, where, and why. This is the second of three webinars in our winter webinar series. My name is Jamie Heflin and I'll be your host for today's meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This is a webinar. Let me switch my slide here. So your camera and microphone has been disabled. If you have a question at any point during the presentation, you can type it into the Q&A box. We will either go ahead and respond um, or we'll answer your question live. During the webinar, we'll be sending out a couple of polls, which are anonymous. And at the end of the webinar, we will be sending out a um, follow-up email with a link to, um, if you're gonna be re, uh, applying for any of those CEU credits, you'll need to go ahead and take that within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. So be sure you're on the lookout for that. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel in early spring. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started with our very first poll here. And this one is just a, Quick poll asking your knowledge of Carex. All right, here. And it looks like, you know, we've got a mix. Certainly some novice and a nice, um, many of you are more in that intermediate stage. So great. And then one more poll as we get started, we're gonna ask how many Carex varieties have you used? So there are many out there. All right, and it looks like most of you are in that one to five range with a few of you having used six or more. Okay, so our presenters for today's webinar are Sales and Operations Manager, Nikki Moline, and Marketing Manager, Shannon McInerney. Nikki has been an integral part of the Midwest team since 2008. She has a passion for native plants, which she enjoys sharing as the main curator of content for the Natural Garden Natives Instagram account. And Shannon has been with Midwest since 2014. One of her many responsibilities at Midwest is to coordinate the many hands that are involved in the design, care, and maintenance of the Midwest gardens. Nikki and Shannon can often be found sharing their extensive plant knowledge on YouTube and Instagram. And with that, I will now turn it over to them so that they can help us all better understand the benefits of Carex. All right, hello everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. It's exciting to see so many people on here excited about Carex. So um, I think all of us here at Midwest um, have been trying to learn more about Carex over the years. It's definitely, become more of a popular plant group, people are more curious about it. So hopefully today um, we'll be able to 
give you guys a few new characters to try or just give you some further insights into uh, this genus. So it is a really large genus of plants. It's actually one of the largest genuses of um, flowering plants. So um, they estimate there's about 1,100 to 2,000 different species of Carex. Um, there might even be more, honestly, Carex. Um, they're pretty promiscuous, so they like to cross a lot, just like oaks. So a lot of times if you have um, you know, a Carex garden or Carex planted close to each other, you might get a mix of the two um, because they definitely um, don't mind sharing pollen and those kinds of things. Uh, but here in Midwest, we grow about um, 40 different Carex species in our product line. And these are really focused on um, Carex that are native to Illinois. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We have, I think, two that might not be, um, you know, local ecotype here to the Chicagoland area. But, um, you know, for the most part, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, the majority of these Carex, again, are in our natural garden natives um, branded plant line. And natural garden natives are local ecotype to the Chicagoland area. So the seed has been sourced within 90 miles of our nursery in St. Charles, Illinois. So these plants were um, born and bred here in the uh, in the Chicagoland suburbs, so they're really well suited for our environment. Um, but back to Carex, um, they're definitely a super important uh, component of restoration projects, naturalizing areas, and green infrastructure features like bioretention and bioswales. So a lot of Carex are really set up for more um, wetland areas, pond edges, again, bioswales, which are great for um, stormwater runoff, those kinds of things. But then there are also a lot that are great for landscape settings too, which we'll be diving into um, today. And Shannon's going to give you a little bit of overview about our Carex classroom, which is where we um, have tested a lot of this. But before we do that, I want to give you guys just a few more facts on Carex because there are so many. Um, so when you're kind of going through these Carex today, I would like you guys to keep in mind that a lot of these can be used as a lawn substitute um, if you want to get away from turf grass, which is not very environmentally sustainable. Um, they can even be used as a mulch substitute in some cases. And um, you know, they're great plants, again, for wetland areas. They're great plants for our local fauna. So um, for those of you get, that have seen me speak before, I'm a bird nerd. Um, so I love feeding birds. And Carex are actually awesome for attracting even some of the more rare birds in, um, in Illinois, like wild turkeys and um, really cool ducks, like wood ducks. So um, if you have a client or yourself that's really interested in that kind of stuff, Carex are amazing. And then I think another thing that people don't realize about Carex is they're actually one of the um, biggest host plants for a lot of like butterflies and moths. And for example, um, Carex pensylvanica, which is an awesome plant, and we'll talk about that today, um, hosts over 36 species of caterpillars. So again, we think about flowers when we're thinking about pollinators or, you know, um, butterflies, moths, but, you know, they really are um, great plants for that. They are cool season plants. So again, everything that we're going to talk about today is a cool season grass, meaning they grow most active in the spring and in the fall. Um, and, you know, there's really a such for um, every situation. So as we dive in, we'll go through that. But now I'll kick it to Shannon so she can tell you a little bit about our Carex classroom. Thanks, Nikki. So yes, our Carex classroom was installed back in 2015. And um, this, like a lot of our gardens, kind of, you know, came from feedback of our customers of, you know, wanting to know more about Carex, but ne needing a place to be able to actually see them. So um, the original design for the garden was done by Trish Beckshord, who was our um, native uh, sales rep for several years. And we, we miss her dearly now, but she's out in Pennsylvania. Um, so yes, she did the original design. And since then, um, Enrique Rodriguez, who is our production foreman at our Midwest Natural Garden Nursery, he is actually on the call with us today in case we get to any questions that stump Nikki or I. Um, he handles kind of the stewardship of this garden. So now, you know, when we find something's not working well, 
you know, he'll, he'll decide whether it's worth it to try to replant it, whether we've tried it enough times and we really need to make the switch to something else. Um, so he really manages what's going into this garden at this point, along with managing all our production at the, at the natural garden location. So, um, so our Carex garden has about 20 varieties of the 40 we carry, and it, it is a, um, you know, uh, kind of under an, an oak, uh, you know, clearing. So the back side of it is more shaded, probably a little bit more damp. So, and then the front um, closer to the road on 64 is sunnier. It's still, you know, not totally dry, but a little bit drier than the back edge of it. So um, we do experiment. You can see that we include both woodland and wetland varieties in there. And it is kind of testing some of those wetland varieties to see if, you know, they can survive outside of a true wetland environment. Um, so along with it, you're welcome to come and visit this um, this anytime our, our natural garden location is open. Um, we just ask that you stay in this and we've got the other display gardens there. We ask that you stay up in the gardens and don't wander back into our production facilities, but you're welcome to come visit when we're open for business. Um, we do have some maps there to kind of help guide you through, um, but it, it is meant to educate people on, uh, you know, the differences between the Carex to in general help promote Carex as a species, you know, or as a genus itself to make people more aware of all the different varieties to show examples of how you can use the Carex in the landscape. So for example, I mean, one of the most striking parts in spring is it's kind of a river of Carex pensylvanica and pulmonium and Flaxa vericata, and it's beautiful. And it's a great way to showcase people how we can work the Carex in with other varieties, um, you know, into, into sustainable landscape designs. And then, um, Again, I mentioned it's kind of experimental in ways that, you know, we're testing some of the limits of sun to shade and, and, and wet to a little bit drier. And then also it's a production resource for us. So we do do seed collection off the carrots in this garden. So it's serving production purposes for us as well. So, um, you know, again, I mentioned we've got about 20 varieties here, but we do try to incorporate carrots in many of our other gardens as well. Um, that we have in St. Charles. So we'll try and highlight today, um, you know, where, where they are, where you can see them kind of live and in action. Every, every variety we are talking about today is in at least one of our gardens. So I think that's really great that, um, you know, we can kind of point you to, to, to real live examples of these. So with that, we will get into um, the Carex varieties. So the first one we are going to talk about is Carex albicans. And this, the common name for this is white tinge sedge. And that has both the, the leaf blades. So the, it kind of has this fine bright green foliage that gets a whitish tinge to it, but also the flower, it's kind of a scaly um, flower head and that gets a white margin to it as well. So that, that's where the name comes in. And um, this variety gets about 18 to 24 inches tall. And uh, soil, it it does do well or kind of, I guess with a lot of carrots, we're going to talk about what it can tolerate and also what it prefers, because a lot of them, as you know, as I mentioned, we're testing the limits in the carrots classroom. A lot of these can be very adaptable given the right conditions or, you know, given if it's a little more wet location, it can handle a little bit more sun. So we'll kind of talk about those things. So this variety can handle um, full sun to full shade. Its preference would be, you know, more on the shady side. And then in terms of, of water, kind of moist, well-drained soil, but can go towards the drier side. So this is kind of found in the, um, rockier, sandier areas, so it can be more drought tolerant. Um, as an example of this, we actually have this one included in our dry shade garden in St. Charles. So um, we have found, again, kind of the name implies, in a dry shady situation, this one has done just fine for us there. I should mention that we'll indicate as we go, but as Nikki mentioned our natural garden natives. This one we do not carry as a natural garden native. It is not local ecotype, um, but it, the, um, the material we have is native to the Midwest. And um, 
so as you can kind of tell by the descriptions of this one, it's a pretty versatile plant and it can tolerate a wide range of soil conditions and light conditions, um, just given the exact situation. Um, one other thing to mention about Carex in general is that they are all pretty deer resistant. In our other talks, we get that question a lot, but I think we'll kind of just make the blanket statement there that most of the Carex are, are pretty well deer resistant. So that is Carex albicans. Yeah, and there was a question on whether that was a clump or a spreader. That one is definitely a clump. So. Um, okay, next one is Carex Appalachica, um, which is definitely one of my favorites. I was excited to get to talk about this one. This one's relatively new to our product line and um, another one that's not local ecotype, but definitely super valuable, um, especially I would say in a more cultivated landscape. Um, this is a real easy Carex to um, add into any sort of landscape with other non-native plants as well. So I've seen this one planted kind of in a river and it has very fine foliage, um, almost like spirobolus, but obviously a lot smaller. So this plant only gets eight to 12 um, inches tall and wide, but has a nice mounded um, with that flowy kind of weepy hair-like um, foliage. So really beautiful if you kind of plant it in tighter. Um, and then again, that foliage will kind of just flow through. It's really, really beautiful. Um, this one is a great substitute for Carex Pennsylvanica if you have a drier shade location. So Carex Pennsylvanica, of course, is awesome. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But um, if we have really hot, dry summers, it can brown out um, in kind of the heat of the summer. This guy will not. So this one will take um, dry shade, again, noted there, even around the root zone of trees. Um, so if you have some well-established trees, this one will work really well for you. The other thing that's really cool about this plant is um, its seed head. So well-established ones um, really get loaded with these kind of like starry um, seed heads. It's really, really beautiful. And you can see some on this photo, um, but when it's in full kind of flower slash going to seed, um, really, really quite stunning. Um, the other really cool thing about the seeds, um, again, because I'm a you know, fauna aficionado here, but um, it is a host of the skipper caterpillar and turtles actually love their seed head. So I think that that's pretty cool. Um, it does, it is a clumper, so it's not going to do kind of the runner thing that some um, carrots do. So it stays in a nice tight clump for you. And, uh, you know, if you guys, with, with most carrots, because they are cool season grasses, again, Shannon and I will probably pop in some of these tidbits here and there, but with most um, Carex. Some are evergreen, which we will note as we go through the presentation, but this one, for instance, you're going to want to do a shearing on it late winter because they're cool season grasses. So as soon as those, the weather starts heating up, um, this plant's going to start growing. So make sure you do your, your shearing um, late winter. So that's Carex Appalachica. Okay, we did have a question about um, deer and rabbit resistance. So as I mentioned, most of the varieties of Carex are, are deer resistant. And to my knowledge, Nikki, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think most of them are pretty rabbit resistant as well. I can't say I've ever really seen rabbit issues on any of them or Enrique, I, have, I don't know if uh, you can jump in if you've seen problems in the Carex classroom. Yeah, I definitely have not. So yes, we would, we would go with generally deer and rabbit resistant. Um, okay, our next variety is Carex vermoides. Um, so this is a, again, a kind of a finer textured Carex and also a clump forming one. So um, this is one that kind of the size of the clump will get bigger, but if you want kind of, you know, a full area covered, it would need to be more of a mass planting. It's not one that's going to um, spread by runners as some of them do. So a great, a great non-aggressive ground cover in that sense. So um, this one will, as Nikki said, you know, being cool season, they'll kind of put on their flushes of growth in the earlier part of the season and the later part of the season. So in between that is when we um, do our seed collection. So for example, this one, we collected our seed in June. So then after that, we'll kind of get another flush of growth on the plant. So um, this one we have found to be uh, long-lived in the Carex 
Carrick's classroom for us. It's done very well. Um, it is one that's going to want to be on the wetter side, so it can tolerate. It doesn't necessarily want to be in standing water all the time, but it can tolerate some periods of standing water. And it very much likes um, the conditions that we have in our CARES classroom. So I, I think I forgot to mention earlier, but the soil in the CARES classroom is a very rich, uh, humic soil and you know lots of leaf debris and things like that. And so this is a really great location uh, for CARES spermoides. It really, it really prefers um, that type of soil. So um, part sun is probably, it's, it's, you know, most preferred. Again, it can tolerate a little bit more sun, but the optimum is kind of a partial shade. Again, we have these planted under, you know, some large oak trees. So it kind of is that filtered shade situation. And um, as Nikki said, the, you know, this is a host plant for many uh, butterflies, moths, um, you know, seed for birds. One thing about this one is uh, muskrats will occasionally kind of enjoy nibbling on the roots of this. Um, so in general, this is a, a great plant for kind of, you know, if you have a, a semi-shady rain garden or a low-lying area, this would be a great plant for that situation. So Carex spermoides. All right, we did have a question um, about Carex if they prefer kind of the rich organic soil or do some thrive in poor soils. Um, it really does depend on the Carex actually. Um, some really do need that kind of rich organic soil, um, but there are others that are actually okay in clay soils, um, drier soils, less organic soils. And um, we will note some of those, you know, moving forward, I know a few of them that I'm presenting on do well in poorer soils, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I think is so interesting about this genus as a whole and being so many is really, it does stretch the gamut between dry to wet, sun to shade, clumper to rhizome, and uh, you know, soil tolerance too. So um, I would say there's just probably a Carex option for pretty much any situation. So it's just finding the right one for for what you're looking for. Yeah, and I think it is important to note that a lot of the ones that we're going over today, we specifically chose um, because they are better in a landscape setting. Now, of course, we will note if you can plant them on a pond edge or, you know, in a rain garden, things like that. But a lot of these are really good, um, you know, for, for more of a landscape setting. Um, since that's the majority of what you guys are doing. So, um, all right, the next one here is Carex gracilimus, gracilima, sorry, uh, all these Latin names, uh, purple sheathed graceful sedge. So um, this one actually gets its common name for two reasons. So the purple sheathed is um, when the temperatures are really cool, kind of near the base of the plant, the um, grass sheath or the sedge sheath will actually be kind of a slight purple color. Um, but that doesn't mean the whole, whole you know um, blade is going to be that color so it's really deeper in the in the near the root zone of the plants um, but graceful sedge comes from the name um, from the um, seed heads that actually um, will come after it's done flowering so it gets some really cool uh, seed heads that we actually didn't put a picture in here but um, they look like beads and they kind of are arching very graceful that's where the name comes from but really cool um, seed heads with this one and actually this one really produces a ton of seed heads so if you're somebody that's looking for um, you know a little extra added texture or something interesting to look at in the garden, um, this one would definitely be a good one to try out. So this one does prefer moist, well-drained soils, probably again, more on the moist side. Um, and again, prefers more of that full to part shade. Again, we have this one planted in our Carex classroom under some oak trees in a very rich soil. Um, but it does, you know, very well there. I would uh, recommend, you know, point um, planting it maybe on a forest edge. This one can definitely go on a wetland edge if you have that. Um, it can probably take a little bit more sun if you're planting it in a wetter um, location. But this one's also a clumper, but it does spread by rhizomes. So the clump might not be quite as tight as some of the other ones that we've been talking about, but it still does stay in that kind of nice clump shape. So that one is Carex gracilima. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying to um, 
look at some of the questions really quickly. So we did have a question about where Carex chrysilema was in our trade list. So in the trade list, all of the Carex are going to be under the native grasses section. Um, some of them will be less listed in the perennial section too, depending on the size we carry them in. So if we carry them in pints, they will be there. But if you cannot find them in the trade list for some reason, you can always go to our website and search them there as well. So just a few notes on, on if you're looking for specific varieties. Um, I don't know, Nikki, there were a couple of questions on, on Carex gracilima. Did you wanna get to those? Yeah, I mean, spreading by seed. So any, any native plant will usually um, propagate itself by seed, but I'm not sure that we've, well, so at Natural Garden, we collect the seeds. So I'm not sure we can maybe answer that question um, 100% well, but uh, I don't know, Enrique, if you're able to pop on at least by audio, have you seen um, this one more aggressively spreading by seed or any of the other characters for that matter? We'll see if he's able and to. While he's jumping on, there's also a question about clumping carex spreading via seeds. So some of them do. Um, yeah. So again, it, it is all just variety dependent on some okay. spread by rhizomes and by seed. Um, mm -hmm. So again, very variety dependent. So, mm -hmm. all right, Enrique, Enrique, I think we should be able yes, to- Yes, I, I haven't seen a, a you know, seed itself. We do take care of the garden. So meaning like we're gonna be doing some weeding. So, if we're doing some weeding, like with a Dutch hoe, if there is seeds there, we might be even, you know, like controlling them by mm -hmm. taking care of the garden. So maybe we haven't even given enough time to see if they will germinate on their own. Okay, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, so if it is in more of a cultivated setting, you might not have that issue. And again, we do a lot of seed collection, so we haven't seen a lot of uh, spreading by seed. But um, again, a lot of native plants do self-propagate by seed, um, and it really has to do with the conditions. A lot of native plants have like very specific um, environment or situations that they need the seed to go through to be able to germinate. So. Um, yeah, but we haven't seen these be aggressive, I guess, is what we're we're saying. Um, and like I said, with Carex brasilimus in particular, it is clump, but it does spread by rhizomes. So what that means is that clump is not going to be maybe as tight as like a sporobolus or something like that. The clump's going to be a little looser in appearance. All right, so we will move on to Carex muscingumensis, or palm sedge is the common name. And it gets that name um, from the fact that it, you know, it kind of has the uh, comb, I guess is the right name, but out of that, the leaflets kind of come off of that looking kind of like a palm tree. So it is definitely um, one that looks a little bit different than some of the clumping forms. And this probably is one that if you've used Carex at all, that maybe you're a little bit familiar with. This is probably one that's a little bit um, more popular in the landscape to begin with. So um, it's that the reason for that is probably that this is a very adaptable variety, especially in our climate here in Illinois. So, you know, there was the question earlier about if Carex want a really rich organic soil, this is one that will thrive in clay soil. So obviously we have a ton of clay soil, you know, here in our Chicagoland area. Um, so it'll do really well here. But then in terms of um, light conditions, you know, again, the slide says full to part sun, it will do okay in part shade. Um, water conditions, again, we kind of are striking the, mid the midpoint there with moist well drained. Um, it, it can take a, a wetter condition as well. So, um, you know, it probably doesn't want to be wet all the time, but it, it does probably prefer to be on the damper side. Um, well, I don't want to steal Nikki's thunder on the next one, but so we, uh, we do also have this one in our dry shade garden though. Um, so again, it's doing just fine kind of in a, um, in a dry, shadier place. I was looking for a picture of it and I couldn't find one there, but, um, you know, I do remember that area of the garden looking quite, looking quite nice last year. So I guess I would say come check it out in, in spring. Um, so this is also again, a host for satyr butterfly or brown butterfly larva. 
Um, so that's an interesting fact about this one. And being on the little bit taller side, it's good for providing cover for wildlife throughout the summer. So you can see, I mean, that's a plug flat there, but it does form a pretty nice dense plant. Um, so it's good for, for wildlife protection during the summer. So this is Carex muscingumensis. Uh, there was a question on shearing late winter for Caris, Carex mus muscingumensis. That one's a challenging one to pronounce. So Shannon, do you know what we do on this one? I mean, I Enrique might be able to answer this one as well, or I guess we don't have this one in the clerics classroom, but um, the locations that we do have this, we treat like we do all of our gardens and we cut it back. Um, I think it's kind of when the question asked like late winter, so in February into March, um, and it's done just fine. So yeah, we typically leave everything up for the winter and do a big cut back. And so that's what we've been doing with the muscingumensis. Um, and then there was a question on pH requirements on carex in general. So I would say we don't do any soil amendments when we're planting our gardens, especially with carex classroom. Um, so, you know, I would say that, you know, whatever kind of pH soils we have here in the Midwest, the carex seem to do just fine. Um, we haven't seen the pH you know, be an issue or need to do any soil amendments to adjust that. So, uh, so onto Carex ohm, which is another fun word to say. Um, this is actually a variety of the native species, um, a, a selection. So, if you're a native purist, maybe look away for a minute. But we do sell all sorts of plants, both varieties and street species. So, American Beauty's native plants um, is a plant program where they both sell, that's a national native plant program that they sell both straight species and selected varieties. So this is one that we have in the American Beauty's native plant line. Um, and it's a really great plant. It's a really great landscape plant. Um, how it differs from the straight species is it's a little bit shorter, more compact, um, and then it has this really nice variegation. So um, has a kind of yellow margin on the foliage. So, you know, from afar, it just makes that plant look a little bit more chartreuse, um, you know, which is a nice quality to have. Um, the other thing I've noticed on this plant is um, it, it, the seed heads are a bit more prolific on this one too. So kind of a cool attribute as well. We have this one planted in a um, median garden here at Midwest. So it's in a pretty harsh location. It's in between a uh, big gravel lot and then a um, paved lot. Doesn't get a lot of love. We do not irrigate. We do not do anything to this garden. And this plant is absolutely thriving. Um, I would say in most cases, it's in more of a full sun location, although a few are under some small ornamental um, shade trees. But either way, doing great. Um, it's fine with uh, drier soils. But again, we have a couple of these planted near um, drainage, you know, areas and the plant is doing just fine. So very versatile plants, um, again, a little bit more compact in that variegation, but that one is Carex Ohm. Um, yes. Yeah, so then on the muscingumensis, really quick, sorry, I forgot to mention, because I know we've had a lot of questions on clumpers. Um, so that one is kind of a clumper, but it does spread by rhizomes. And then it's one that also will self-seed. So um, I would say, I mean, you saw the picture of the ohm just there, but that one is probably one that's going to be a little bit more on the aggressive side, where it kind of has a lot of different ways to, um, to spread itself. Um, and then we also have another question on the um, demonstration gardens about what kind of supplemental irrigation we provide. So um, I would ask uh, Enrique actually to speak specifically to the Carex classroom, but in terms of the display gardens in St. Charles, we do not have in-ground irrigation here. Um, if it gets to the point where we are in a really you know, long drought period, like, you know, we had some extended periods last summer, um, we will supplementally irrigate just for the fact that, you know, we've invested a lot in these gardens and we don't want to lose them. But we, you know, we're not watering two times a week on a regular schedule or anything like that. It's really just when we're getting into really severe drought periods is when we will water. Um, so like with the, the dry shade garden, you know, did we water it on occasion? Last summer, yes, but it's not like we're, you know, watering it on a regular schedule. We're trying to let it be as as is. So 
Um, okay, so on to Carrick's Pennsylvanica. So I would say this is the Carrick's that maybe kind of started it all at Midwest Ground Covers or was the launching point. So probably just about 10 years ago, um, our owner, Krista Oram Keller, really decided you know, that she wanted to help promote uh, Carrick's and, and, you know, kind of get Carrick's into the trade a little bit more. Um, and this is the one we chose to really lead with just for its um, kind of versatility and um, uh, adaptability. So um, I would say this is the Carrick's we definitely have in the most gardens throughout the property. And the picture in the upper left there um, is a swath of it under a group of crab apples, like right near our front entrance parking. And this picture does not do it justice. Okay. This is like the most beautiful area in spring. And it gets to a point where we'll have like a couple, um, bleeding heart coming up through it, but just, you know, the fine textured foliage, it's just this really nice, rich green color. Um, that's when the seed heads are blooming. It is just beautiful and so peaceful and and just like one of my favorite places on the property so definitely come check that out in spring um but you can see it's also a fabulous ground cover so um this is one that may take a little bit to kind of again it's it's clumping um but but does kind of spread slowly i would say um so you'll want to plant it on the tighter side, but then it will start to fill in. Um, but just, you know, a, a, like Nikki said earlier, this is one that is a great lawn alternative. So um, it could be a no mow lawn alternative if you chose, you know, it will kind of start to flop over a little bit in season, but you know, some people are good with that. I, I believe that's what they do um, up at Ulbrich Botanic Garden, or I think I think they might mow it. So kind of a low mow, like a couple times a year, but this is something, you know, if you choose, you can keep it at two inches or you can just let it go. But um, a great lawn substitution, as Nikki mentioned in the beginning, this is one that's gonna, you know, can tolerate the dryer a little bit, will brown out if it gets really hot, but generally will do fine on the drier side to, to the moist well drained side. Um, so I don't know, I feel like there are so many things to say about this one. As I mentioned before, it's a great underplanting. We have it combined with other, other perennials in the Carex classroom. Um, and it gets its name, you know, from, from often being found in oak savannas and growing under oak trees. So the, the common oak sedge name. So again, just one, we have in a lot of places and a lot of gardens around here. So if you're looking for how to use it in an, a landscape application, I would definitely come check it out. Getting a lot of questions about salt tolerance on uh, Carex. I would say Carex are probably not the most salt tolerant. We don't salt really on our property, so we can't speak to that because we we have irrigation ponds with the water runoff. We can't add salt um, on our property, but um, I would probably not recommend you plant Carex in a more salty um, location. So. Um, just based on what I know about the plants. Um, and then we are getting um, some questions on the mowing. Um, so if you guys want to freshen up the foliage really on any Carex, um, you guys can cut it back again in late winter is really the time because all Carex are cool season grasses, meaning the minute the weather starts you know, warming up, the plant is going to start growing. So, you know, in production, we do a lot of cleaning up of the, the plants, doing a light shearing um, in the late winter, early spring before those plants start actively growing. So that's definitely um, what I would recommend there. Um, and then on the mowing, I don't think we've ever trialed it here, but like Shannon said, um, Ulbrich Botanic Garden up in uh, Madison has definitely trialed it. It's worked. Now with any of these carrots as a lawn substitute, they're not going to be a heavy foot traffic lawn substitute, they're going to be a light foot traffic lawn substitute, where if somebody needs to walk in the yard once in a while, um, or, you know, even maybe has a dog, that's okay, but it's not going to handle heavy foot traffic. So if it's going to be somewhere, you know, people are walking all the time, this is definitely not that type of lawn substitute. So just want to make sure um, that those questions are answered, because there were quite a few, a few of them. 
Right. Um, so Care Explains to Jenea is the next one. And there have been a lot of questions too on evergreen and um, if things are aggressive. If things are aggressive or things are evergreen, we will note them as we go through. So every Care is a little bit different, so we can't give blanket answers for that one. But Care Explains to Jenea is um, almost evergreen, meaning, you know, if it gets a lot of protection, if it's under snow, those kinds of things, it will remain pretty green throughout the winter. But again, if you need to freshen up the foliage, don't be afraid to give it a light shear in the late winter. Um, so this plant's really cool. I think the first time I saw it, I actually, um, before I dove into the world of Carex, thought it was a hosta. It almost has like a really strappy kind of thin um, look like a hosta. I was kind of confused when I first saw it, but um, it's a really cool plant. It's probably, again, one of my favorite carrots because it has a really different texture. Um, this guy is um, probably gonna like more full shade. It will take some sun, but will thrive the best in a fuller shade environment. Um, so again, it would be great for maybe more of a woodland um, edging planting. And this one is also one that really prefers richer soils. So um, maybe wouldn't do quite as well in a clay or really dry soil situation, um, but it definitely will do good in a um, organically rich, moist soil. Um, and this one is definitely a clumper. Um, again, it will spread by um, rhizomes, but this one's actually a pretty slow grower, so it's not going to take over. It's not aggressive at all. It'll really stay um, in that nice clump. And we have this one planted in a couple places. We have it planted at Natural Garden. We also have it planted um, here near our employee walkway. And um, I will say the employee walkway, I think the plants have been here for a couple of years and it's stayed in its clump, hasn't really gone anywhere. It almost looks exactly like that picture. So um, really nice addition if you're looking uh, to try something. And it's great to plant with like heuchera, Fox de Vericata, Iris cristata, um, other kind of light shade plants. Um, a really nice stunning plant. So that's uh, Carex plants of Jamea. All right. So uh, Nikki, I know Nikki kind of followed up the after the after Carex Pennsylvanica, but we're getting a lot of questions about as a lawn alternative. Um, so we have not used it as a lawn alternative here. I guess the best suggestion, and I hope he's okay with me sending people his way, but again, um, at Ulbrich Botanic Gardens, they are using it as a lawn alternative up there. How much um, they are, you know, I think they have some areas that they leave a little bit longer, but they may have some areas that they're cutting you know, more to two inches as well. So um, Jeff Epping is the director up there. So I would say if you want some more specifics, maybe check out Ulbrich's website and see if they have some more information um, or we can potentially put you in touch with him. So, um, so next up we have Carex radiata or straight style, styled wood sedge. Um, so this one is very similar to Carex rosea, which Nikki is gonna talk about next. Um, but this one is straight styled wood sedge because of on the flower, um, how it is, uh, pertains to the tip of the female flower that it's straight as opposed to curly on rosea. So this is one that is going to be evergreen and it works well in both sun and shade, but probably a little bit, or probably right in the middle actually of part shade is what's going to be preferred. So again, kind of that, you know, dappled understory where it's getting some filtered light. Um, so this is one does well in again, damp soil. So kind of, again, this is one that would like the organically rich soil. Um, we do have this one in the Carex classroom. So again, it's, it's happy in those conditions there. Um, so the, how this one gets his name is for, they're not technically flowers, but kind of what you see there um, are akines, I believe is how you say it. And so they come out, you know, off the stem and then radiate, radiate outward in kind of a star shape. So that's where the Latin name comes from. But as it begins to happen, this is one that will flop open a little bit. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with like moisture conditions or anything like that. It's just kind of the nature of the plant. So um, this is one actually I mentioning with the soil conditions. Um, 
this one should not dry out. So, it, you know, we're not going to try this one in the dry shade garden because this is one that likes to stay damp. And if we do get into a hot, dry period, it is one that would definitely need some supplemental water. So if it's going to be more, you know, at a stream edge or something like that, or a period that's always kind of wet, this would be great for that location. And um, again, you know, great for many different varieties of songbirds and a food source for many insects. Um, uh, and one that grows in dense clumps as well. So um, it will, again, just kind of spread by the clump size, but not necessarily by the rhizomes. So this is Carex radiata. Okay, um, the next one that we have is Carex rosea. Um, so like Shannon kind of mentioned, Carex uh, radiata and Carex rosea are really similar, but the difference is Carex rosea is actually more adapted to dry shade. Um, so while radiata really needs to stay more moist, um, rosea will take periods of dry and even a dry shade uh, situation. This is another Carex that's semi-evergreen. Um, again, I know I'm seeing a lot of questions about the shearing and evergreen, semi-evergreen. So with any plants, if it's evergreen, you can still shear it back and refresh the foliage, the plant will still grow. So just something, just because something's evergreen um, doesn't necessarily mean that we can never cut it back and leave it alone. So all evergreen plants can be sheared, pruned, you know, to, to refresh foliage. But again, with Carex, just make sure you're doing it late winter because they're cool season and you wanna do it before they start actively growing. Um, now with Carex, you can cut them back to about an inch um, you know, above the, the crown of the plant um, and they should do just fine. So don't worry, you're not gonna you know, kill an evergreen Carex if you do a shearing um, before it starts actively growing. Um, so again, this one here, Carex rosea is semi-evergreen um, and this one is definitely more versatile on the soil side of things. So it can take periods of moist, um, but it definitely can take periods of dry. So very versatile plants. Um, this is another one that would be a good one as a lawn substitute. Um, again, low traffic. It cannot take a lot of foot traffic, but if you had a low traffic area, um, you could use this one. It's a pretty short plant. It only gets eight to 12 inches tall. So again, really good for a shade lawn substitute. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, while we're preparing for this, a cool tidbit I found was this one in particular does really well under white and red oaks, which are oaks um, more adaptable to dry locations where, you know, you might be able to use Carex radiata under swamp oak or oaks that, you know, need a wetter situation. So, um, one note on this one is it is full to part shade, but this one actually prefers um, a little bit more sun. Um, they call it bright shade. So if it can get maybe a little morning sun or some dappled sun, um, it would make it a little bit happier than being in full shade. Um, and this one uh, definitely naturalizes. Again, it, it, it is a clump form, but it will naturalize more by the short rhizome. So it's kind of like Carex Pennsylvanica will, where it will give that bunchier kind of look. Um, but again, eventually it'll fill in and full um, create kind of that long look. So this one is Carex brosia. Sorry, we are trying to get to your questions as quick as we can, but there are a lot of them coming in. So just we're working on it. Uh, okay, Carex start well eye. So this is one um, that we have found to be, uh, to do quite well in the Carex classroom. And this was actually, I believe, Enrique's idea to try this one out. Um, we had not originally had it planted in there. So this is going to be on the taller side for, um, you know, a lot of the Carex that we're talking about today at three to four feet tall. And um, this is one that does uh, quite well in sunny conditions. So we have it kind of up more towards the front of the Carex classroom. So um, you can kind of see the, the black rhizomes as the leaves come up. So this is one that is going to fill nicely by runners um, and it has been quick to establish for us. So just a really good performer in the Carex classroom thus far. Um, it does tolerate a range of moistures. Um, so probably again on the damper side, but can play with that a little bit. 
and it has these cool kind of papery looking inflorescences. So um, again, if you're looking for a taller Carex, this would be a great option for that. So this is Carex Sartwellii. All right, we'll do a handful more questions here. Um, inventory questions, please check out our website. We have live availability on there. Um, so if you have any inventory questions, please just check that out. Um, it updates every 10 minutes. So pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and then question on, are there any warm season Carex? There are not. So um, at least not in our area that are native here to the Midwest, they are all cool season grasses. Um, so yeah, it's kind of nice, easy to remember. We don't have to remember what's cool season and warm season when we're talking in one genus, they're all cool season. All right, so Carex shortiana. Um, short sedge. So this one's not the shortest Carex, but we call it short sedge, um, which I find kind of funny, but this one's going to get about 18 to 24 inches tall. So this one's one of the taller ones that we've uh, talked about today. And this is another one um, that definitely prefers um, wetter soil. So it needs good moisture. Um, it won't really take uh, long periods of really dry. So if you guys are going to try and use this, make sure it's in a, um, you know, richer soil, wetter soil. This one can be used on a pond edge. Um, but if it is in a sunnier location, basically with this one, the sunnier um, the location, the wetter the plant needs to be. So again, it could probably tolerate being on a pond edge in some sun um, because that soil will be more um, consistently wet. Um, let's see, what else on this guy? Um, oh, this one gets really cool seed heads too. Um, the seed heads on Carex are really interesting. The more you get to know Carex, the more you trial different varieties, you'll see how different they are. For being one genus, um, the seed heads vary um, quite quite a bit. So this one um, has seed spikes that turn a really deep chocolate brown color um, as they age, which is really interesting. Again, if you're looking for something different. Um, the other cool thing about this Carex is it's actually pollinated by wind um, and not um, insects. So this is one that again will be more of a clump but does spread by rhizomes. So um, it may not stay uh, potentially quite as tight um, as some of the other carrots that we've talked about, but a really great one, um, taller one to use in the gardens. And I know there was a question on what plants um, to plant with these carrots. Um, carrots are a great matrix base plant. So if, and what I mean by that is if you want to use other flowering natives or perennials or anything like that, you can do kind of sweeps of carrots or you can do blocks of carrots with other perennials kind of popping up. And, um, you know, in our Carex classroom, like Shannon said, we have these plants integrated with spring ephemeral. So the Carex start coming up and then we have these nice pops of, you know, Mertensia or Aquilegia. Um, and then we also use them as base plants with Dicentra coming up. Um, so they're really versatile. You can do a lot with them. Um, so kind of think along those lines when you're using Carex from a design aspect. All right, so um, we are on to Carex sprangelii or longed beak sedge. Um, so I would, I guess, assume that it gets its name from that kind of flower spikelet, um, you know, that kind of comes out and then droops over a little bit. So this is one, um, probably one of the, I, don't, I wouldn't say more interesting, but the more obvious for a landscape application, you know, a, a more obvious seed heads. Um, to provide interest in the landscape. So again, this is one that's a little bit on the taller side at 18 to 24 inches. Um, and it does prefer moist soil, but can tolerate some drought. Um, it, again, is one that works well in full shade to part sun, but it will even do okay in full sun if it's in a rich enough soil. So um, again, this one is a clump form. So again, kind of nice for the landscape that it's not going to be running everywhere. It'll just kind of be in a bit of a spreading clump. And um, it will also spread by seed. So this, again, is not rhizominous, but um, will spread by the clump size and then also by the seed. So again, um, this one, as most are good food source for migrating birds with the seeds. 
And um, we have this one planted in our perennial and ornamental grass display garden. So you can see it there. So Carex Spengelii. Okay, next one is uh, Carex Vulpinoidea. Um, and this is one that we've seen too, um, that's been used on more, I would say like commercial landscape applications. Um, this one can definitely be a bit more aggressive. So in that instance, um, if we're trying to control how aggressive a plant is, we have two different strategies. One is make sure it has enough competition. So tight, you know, plants it tight with other plants. So it can't just run rampant. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, maybe with the Carex, we're not gonna plant it in its most ideal um, setting. So for instance, if this um, plant really likes wet, then we might want to plant it in a little bit of a drier location just, just to control how aggressive it's going to be. But, um, you know, being aggressive, I know that's a negative word, but, you know, these plants all have a purpose. So, you know, if you have an area that's more open or again, um, a pond edge or a rain garden, this plant would definitely be an excellent um, addition to those locations. Um, as you can see on the slide there, it does like alternating levels of moisture. Um, so that again would qualify it really well for a bioswale, um, stormwater runoff location or a rain garden. So you know, those are all great things that we have use for, um, and you can definitely use Carex vulpinoidea for that. So this one, again, gets a little bit taller, 24 uh, to 36 inches tall, gets its, its name brown fox edge um, from its seed head. So they named it that way because they thought that the seed head actually looked like a fox tail. So kind of easy to remember, fox edge, um, vulpinoidea is like the Latin name fox. So, um, and let's see here. Oh, this one, it will actually do really well in clay so so I know we have that question early on, um, which ones would be more adaptable. This one I believe has, you know, a bit of a chunkier root system. So it'll break through that clay soil um, a bit better than maybe some other um, carrots. So like I said, um, can be a bit aggressive, but maybe just don't plant it in its most ideal situation or make sure that it has enough competition. So that one is Carex vulpinoidea. All right, and so our second to last slide. So this is Carex Jamesia. And you'll see at the top there that this one is coming soon. So this is one that we actually did carry up until a few years ago. And um, we ended up taking it out of our trade list because we had just been really struggling with production of it. So this is one um, that we do collect seed off of and had been struggling with the germination. So it is planted in the Carex classroom. It had been doing just fine there. So we, you know, we know we can get it to grow, but it was more um, the production of it that was the issue. So, and, you know, we're excited to share that we think, or Enrique thinks he has cracked the code for this one. And um, we are hoping and I don't know if planning is a good enough word yet, but we're really hoping that we'll have this one back in inventory in 2023. So um, we do want to promote it because we, we do think it's a great Carex. And again, it has been growing well for us in the Carex classroom. So um, this is, a, again, one that's, you know, doing well there because it's typically found in kind of rich woodland soils. Um, it is going to spread primarily by reseeding. So again, we've been collecting seed off there. Um, it has some nice glossy foliage. It is kind of semi evergreen um, and will do well a little bit on the drier side. Um, this is one that is also a host um, for some of the brown butterfly again and uh, grasshoppers, leaf beetles, all, all those kinds of things. So um, again, we are, you know, it's looking good right now, but really hoping to have this one back in stock next year. All right, so to kind of close out our presentation today, um, we're kind of through all the different plants. So thank you guys for sitting through that. And um, if you have any additional questions here before the end of the presentation, pop those in the Q&A. Um, but we wanted to tell you, um, 
obviously not everything always goes perfectly. And so today we highlighted the stuff that has worked the best for us in our trial gardens and, you know, from what we've heard from customers and things like that. Um, but there are a few things that did not work well. So Carex normalis and Carex squarosa were two that we had a ton of trouble with in the Carex classroom. Um, high losses over the winter, we tried replanting them, we tried reciting them, um, and it just, it, it was not successful for us. So um, we want to be forthcoming with that information to tell you guys, like, you know, sometimes the plants aren't successful where they put them, where we put them. Um, and like I said, with these, you know, trying them in a different location within the Carex classroom. So they may just like, you know, wetter locations or more sun or something that we're not giving them. Um, so again, we focus today on plants specifically in the Carex classroom that we think are good um, landscape Carex that are good for multiple applications, not just restoration. Um, but these two we found um, to not really be successful. So um, Enrique, I don't know if you have any other comments on these two in particular. I think one of them was planted like right at the base of one of the oaks and was not doing very well. Um, so I don't know. Maybe Enrique does not have anything else to say. Oh, here he is. There we go. <laughs> no, I, I do. I do. Uh, I do have a uh, couple things to say. Yeah, they don't even root it in. They didn't even produce enough roots. So I guess, um, especially normal, is we have trouble like getting to establish. It's not like they were, they did fine for a couple of months and they started to tie back. <laughs> that one from the very beginning didn't, didn't, didn't like the spot there. Esquarosa is there, but it's not, uh, not doing much. It's not dying, but it's not full. So it doesn't look that great. So that's what I have to say for those two characters. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so like Shannon said, we highly encourage you guys to stop by the Carex classroom um, to, to see for yourselves what the plants look like. Um, again, we're not doing a ton of maintenance. We do some weeding, but we're not, you know, um, you know, we're not adding things to the soil. We're not um, irrigating. So you guys can come out throughout the seasons to see how things are doing and looking. Um, so to close out today, we do have just a couple more polls and then just a few more um, reminders for you guys. So we'll um, start with uh, which is the following best describes your role. So when we do these presentations, um, we just like to get an idea of who we're talking to. Carex specifically is a pretty like um, specific plant group, I guess. So we wanted to see um, who we were chatting with today. So you guys could put that in there for us. Um, there's a question about what sizes are most available for installs. So um, pretty much all of our carrots are available in 38 flat tray or plug trays. Um, and then the varieties that we've kind of, I don't know, deemed, you know, more suitable for the landscape, we carry most of those in pints as well. Um, we carry some in gallons. That's probably a little bit you know, more sporadic, but so yes, definitely plugs and a lot of these would be available in pints. All right, and the uh, good question, what books? Um, if none of you guys have heard of it, I would definitely check out Swink and Wilhelm, um, Native Plants for the Chicagoland Region. That is like the Bible for plants around here. It's not Carex specific, but all Carex that are native um, to Illinois, I believe are in that book. So in that book, just native plants in general can give you so much information. Um, so we all use that one here quite a bit when we're doing research and learning. All right, so what type of projects do you guys in, um, anticipate you to, using Carex for? And this will just help us if we do education in the future, knowing how we should um, target our presentations. Um, and while you guys are answering that last poll, um, I want to remind you if you're a landscape architect uh, to please take the quiz after this to make sure you get your CEUs. Um, and then you guys will also see a survey at the end. Please let Shannon and I know um, how your experience was today with this presentation. Um, awesome residential garden. So good. I'm glad we were targeting our content today in the right way. Um, 
But again, with the survey at the end, we'd really like your feedback so we can continue to create um, educational content that um, works for you guys and is giving you guys what you need. And if you have ideas on other uh, webinars we can do, please let us know. Uh, but we have one more for the season. It's going to be March 18th. Um, it is Taming the Wild Native Plants for Residential Landscape. So um, Shannon and I did it down at Invigorate U um, down in Bloomington. So if you guys attended that, um, it's the same presentation. But if you didn't, um, highly recommend it. We'll be showing you guys awesome pictures of our landscapes, plant combinations, and going through specific plants as well. So uh, Shannon, anything else to add? <laughs> yeah, we had a couple of questions again on the book title. Oh, okay. So again, and thank you for somebody sharing the full name, but um, it is Flora of the Chicago Region thank you. Thank by you. Uh, Jared Wilhelm and Laura Rerica. So Flora of the Chicago Region, that's a they just did a revised version. What was it like within the last five years? Um, the original was was Swink and Wilhelm or Wilhelm and Swink. Say, but so yes, definitely check that one out. Um, yes, I, I think that is pretty much it. So all right, all right. We know we're a couple of minutes over. So <laughs> thank you for joining us today, and we we hope to see you in next month. Bye, guys.